Now this evening our subject is the rise of spiritualism in our day, and I'd like to call your attention to 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, and that is the latter times of the church, some shall depart from the faith, that is, the body of truth that was given by the apostles, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, we are going to cut many corners here this evening, and I hope later on to deal with the subject more adequately we have before. But in beginning a subject of this nature, there are several explanations that are in order. First of all, let me say that spiritualism and spiritism are synonymous terms. Several people have asked me that question, and may I say that they are the same. I want to quote from Dr. Nevius, who's written one of the finest books on the subject. He says, spiritualism are more properly spiritism, and that is the way that he expresses it. It's a belief that the living can hold communication with the spirits of the dead. It's an intercourse with the spirit world. It's a weird, abnormal, and unnatural thing. And again, if I may quote Dr. Nevius, spiritualism, or more properly spiritism, is avowedly based on communications with disembodied spirits. As one of the great intellectual forces entering into modern thought and civilization, it challenges our serious consideration. Now, the second explanation, I think, that is in order is, I'm not speaking tonight specifically of the cult that is known as spiritualism. There is a cult and a group of people. They were very popular after World War I because two men, outstanding men at that time, went off into it, Sir Conan Doyle and Sir Oliver Lodge in England. Both of these men lost sons in the war, and they became almost morbid about the loss of these boys. And the spiritualists began to tell them they had a communication from these boys. And these men began to attend the meetings, and before it was over, Sir Conan Doyle became a medium himself, and he believed that he was in communication with his dead son. And as a result, there are today even more spiritualists in England than in any other country in the world. It may have a great deal more to do with the decline and fall of Great Britain since World War I than many of us can possibly imagine. And there are tonight literally millions of spiritualists in the world. My first contact with this as a cult was in my first pastorate in Nashville, Tennessee. The former pastor, who was one of the most godly men that I've ever known, he told me when I came there, he says, there's a family that has gone into spiritualism. They'll not talk to me at all. And he says, I would suggest that you try to contact them and see if you can win them back. And so one of the first things I did, I went there in the summertime, I went up to visit them. I knocked on the door, rang the doorbell, and I was sure somebody was present. It was August. All the windows were down, the doors were closed, the shades were pulled, and I was rather snoopy when I saw that and knew they'd gone into spiritualism. I went all the way around the house. I was confident somebody was on the inside, and I'm sure they were having a seance of some sort. The next Sunday morning, they were present. The mother and the son were present. And I must confess, they, they were the closest to hippies before we ever had hippies than any two that I've ever seen. The boy was dressed in a very shaggy sort of way. And she made this statement to me. She said, we found your card at the door, 
And we just wanted you to know that it won't be necessary for you to call on us anymore. Said, I attended this church for 15 years, was a member, and I never got anything. And now I've gotten something. And the man who'd been pastor there was one of the greatest preachers. I used to thrill at his messages. His picture's up there in my study. He's one of the men that, of the four men responsible for me being in the ministry. I never heard greater messages than that man gave. And may I say to you tonight, when they said to me, we got nothing in 15 years, I knew where the trouble was. Imagine that kind of confession to make, by the way, and now we've got something. And I said to them, I said, had it ever occurred to you that maybe the reason you didn't get something here was because of the fact that your mind and heart was not open to the Spirit of God, and that now it may be that the devil is communicating with you and not the Lord? Had you ever stopped to think about that? And, of course, they hadn't and didn't care to give any thought to that at all. Now, may I make a third explanation this evening? Spiritualism and demonism are closely allied. In fact, they, again, are probably synonymous terms. And Dr. Nevius, who's probably written the finest book of the past, Dr. Unger has the latest book out on it, and both of them are quite excellent, And Dr. Nevius says, in comparing the phenomena of spiritualism, alleged or actual, with those of demon possession as presented in previous chapters, we are struck with the remarkable correspondence between them. There is a very close resemblance one to the other. In fact, it would be impossible, to, I think, to separate them. Now, these are... Just words of explanation tonight, we'd like to enlarge upon them, but we'll not. And I can only this evening make some observations and suggestions. First of all, under this heading, let me say that there's certain phenomena that takes place which cannot be explained on the basis of known physical laws. That is very well known today and observed by men that are experts, men that are scientists, for many of these things have been examined very carefully. And the phenomena cannot be attributed to pathological derangement or psychological delusion. And there is a great deal of hocus-pocus in spiritualism. One of the reasons that I never gave much thought to it is because so much of it is actually fraud. But may I say that the fact of it is not invalidated by the other fact that there is fraud, deceit, and trickery that's used. Houdini, the magician in his day, made the statement that he could duplicate all of the experiments that the spiritualists performed, with the exception of about 5%. He said, I cannot duplicate the 5%. I can duplicate the others. Well, what about the 5%? He was so entranced by this, however, that he said if you can communicate the dead with the living, that he would leave a code with his wife and that he'd give that code if he could communicate. And after his death, why, spiritualists after spiritualists, and especially in England, they came forward, they had had a communication from Houdini, and she asked them for the code. Not one ever produced the code. In fact, when she died, of course, the code died with her. And up to that time, not one had been able to do that. So it's quite obvious that there is a great deal of fraud that is connected with it. And then the other thing is, you do not have to go to heathen lands. We'll do that tonight in the picture, and we will see this crude heathen manifestation of it. But may I say that we have it right here in the United States. And there are several areas in which it is displayed. For instance, let me begin 
in that which is a rather crude place, in the hills of Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia, there are a group of people called snake handlers. And you may have seen on TV the other night a travel log that dealt with them. I never saw anything myself, and I saw it purposely in view of this message to see how these people get themselves to the place where they're actually willing to take the snakes out. And this very large man that is in charge, he took out, I think I know a rattlesnake when I see it, he took out a big rattlesnake, put it inside of his bosom. He took out a water moxen, I've seen many of those, put it around his neck, and he handled those. Now someone says, well, every now and then one of them dies. They sure do. But why didn't he die? He didn't. It's something that they do. But the one who was narrating the film said that they spent quite a time, and you could see them, in a frenzy. They get themselves actually into a trance where they're absolutely dazed and are almost unconscious before they do that. The snakes were not brought on until this program apparently had progressed for several hours. May I say that that is a form of spiritualism. It's something that they, of course, using Mark 16, they don't use it all. It's interesting how all these cults just reach in and pull out one or two things, but none of them seem to do it all. Well, they're part of it. They are the snake handlers. Then there are today seances of spiritualists that right here in Los Angeles. I'm confident that in Los Angeles tonight there are probably several hundred seances being conducted for their many spiritualists in this area. I'm not sure, but what, in a crowd like this tonight, and they know my subject, and these groups always have a representative, that there probably will be a representative or two here tonight. A uh, seance will be a place where people will gather and the tables will move. They follow a certain ritual, and then suppose voices of departed loved ones will speak to those that are present. Now, a great deal of that, I grant you, is phony today. But some of that has reality connected with it. The story in the Old Testament of Saul going to the witch of Endor, she did not bring Samuel up. You read the record carefully, she was as frightened, by the way, as Saul was himself at what had taken place. Her name means ventriloquist. She was the witch of ventriloquism. And she was a phony herself. But evidently it was satanic. God would never have permitted Samuel to have come back. To begin with, Samuel had told Saul he had no other word for him. That is before Samuel died. And God had forsaken him. And Saul very frankly said that and told the witch of Endor that's the reason he'd appeal to her. And definitely it was satanic. It was nothing in the world but that which can only be explained through demonism and that which is satanic. Now, in our contemporary culture today, we're civilized. We don't have a lot of that, you say. May I say to you, if you want to know how up-to-date this is, Hitler consulted with a medium. I have an excerpt from a spiritualist magazine that says he was a medium himself, that Hitler was and that he was totally possessed by Satan, and the magazine says that. They don't mind saying that. It's quite interesting to look at some of their literature. The medium says very frankly that he's good until he goes into the trance, and then that the spirit that's through him is definitely evil. I think that's an interesting thing that's in connection with spiritualism and this type of thing. After all, what is Antichrist? He will be a man that's totally possessed of Satan. And we're seeing today, I think, manifestations, not only in Hitler, and may I say this, and I say it cautiously, but I say it, and I'm not only confident, that was the report given out by certain magazines. You remember the President de Gaulle consulted the medium. I have been getting information for years concerning him, that he has divine power and that he has been led in a divine way. 
And when the crisis arose in Paris and in France, you remember the news first said that he'd gone away to meditate. And then later on a report came he'd gone to consult a medium. And believe me, the medium gave some pretty good advice. He came back and took over again. And he didn't relinquish his power at all. And not only that, in Washington, I've been reliably informed that many of our elected officials consult fortune tellers and mediums. And the presence of so many of them in that area reveals that somebody's going to them, by the way. That is the place where Gene Dixon, the so-called prophet, prophetess in our day, and she's made some remarkable prophecies, including the death of President Kennedy. And she's made some bad ones, too. Her batting average is not very good. If she'd been a prophet in Israel, she would have been stoned long ago. Because in Israel, a prophet had to be 100% accurate or they were ruled out as a prophet. And she's been wrong many times, but she has said some very interesting things. She runs a syndicated column. I do not know whether it's in papers in California. I've never seen it here. But Ms. McGee and I have noticed it back in Chicago. We noticed it in Houston, Texas, and in Florida, and in Dallas. And this syndicated column, she uses a horoscope, by the way. That finally came out, that that was her method. And a great many people today resort to that type of thing, trafficking in that which is the occult, that which is borderline today. And a great many people finally fall for it and, of course, go finally into spiritualism. Now, I'm confident that this woman is motivated by satanic power. Now, I know somebody's going to say to me, now, you don't mean, Dr. McGee, that this very lovely person, and she is that, makes a tremendous impression, appears to be very religious, that she is motivated by satanic power. Would you like to hear what the Apostle Paul says in this connection in 2 Corinthians 11, chapter, verses 13 and 15? For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Always they are attractive, the ministers of Satan. It's no accident that the founders of all of these cults and the leaders in them are as attractive people physically as you've ever seen. The devil's very careful about the ones he picks out. And he always makes his ministers, ministers of light, he doesn't go around and say, I'm the devil. He doesn't go around and give the impression that he is ugly or unattractive, for he's not. He's an angel of light, the most attractive creature that God ever created. And then if you want to know how far this is intruding today into the church, and I'm not treating this tonight, as I've already indicated, as a cult, this thing is penetrated into the church, into all areas of the church, especially the liberal wing of the church. And we have a bishop, and he's not my bishop, but the, the Episcopal Church has a bishop, a Bishop Pike, and his son committed suicide. And that's a dreadful, awful thing. And at that time, I composed a letter to send to him in sympathy because I felt that he needed it at that time, losing a boy under those circumstances. But may I say to you, now since then, he's been consulting these mediums and he declares, now here's a man that is a bishop in a Protestant church declaring that he's communicating with a dead boy or that the medium has communicated with him. May I say to you, friends, this thing is right close to us today and it's moving in very close. Now I want to say something and I've thought this over very carefully and I haven't said it for years. In fact, I've never said it. The leaders in the tongues movement today, I've observed them rather carefully, and I have said, and it's in my books on the speaking in tongues, 
that there are three explanations for the tongue's movement and for these faith healings. Either they are self-deceived, and I'm confident some of them are, or the second explanation is that it's psychological. And I'm confident that that's true in many cases. I'm sure that some of the tongues can be explained by people being self-deceived. I'm confident that for others it's merely a psychological expression. A great many people have difficulty speaking, maybe tongue-tied or stutter or something like that. The tongue's movement gives them a tremendous psychological outlet, and many that have difficulty expressing themselves. I talked to a young man that went into it, and then later he came out of it because he very frankly said that he knew he was kidding himself. And then he began to drink beer. And he says, I do a better job talking after beer than I ever did before. And may I say to you, he's becoming an alcoholic because it frees him and enables him to speak, which he was not able to do before. It's a psychological now, the third explanation is demon possession, or it's a form of spiritualism. Now, I have always ruled out the third. The first night I spoke on the tongues movement here, I said that I did not believe, or did I think that any of them could be classified under demon possession. There was a young Baptist preacher here that night. He'd been a former student of mine. He'd gone off into this movement. And then he came out of it. And he came down to me afterward that night. He was angry. He came up and had quite an interview with me uh, two or three days before I brought the message. And he says, I told you again and again it was demon possession. And tonight you rule that out. Now, he says, you haven't been there. I was there. I was in it. And I'm confident that it's demon possession. May I say that I'm willing to say tonight... There are three explanations for the tongues movement and faith healers, and it's one of the three. And I think demon possession could be coming under it. I believe that the faith healers, have you ever noticed how they talk about miracles? Now, people keep coming to me and say, well, Dr. McGee, they're very humble. They say they can't heal themselves. God has to do it. May I say to you, why do they keep talking about miracles? All about miracles. Somebody is now sending me a magazine of one of the latest ones that comes into our midst, and she had quite an article on miracles. Well, if she's not performing miracles, then, for goodness sake, say so. But she calls them miracles. And people are deceived by this. Now, I'm confident that I, the folk come and say, all oh, people are being healed in Alhambra. There is the daughter of a very prominent man in Alhambra, and she declared she was healed, that she had terminal cancer, or I don't know whether it was terminal or not, but it was a very bad case of cancer. And she went about saying that she'd been out here to the Shrine Auditorium. She'd been healed. She told everybody that. They buried her about three weeks ago. She died of cancer. Now, may I say to you that that type of thing today is an awful deceit to tell people and for her to go about. Now, how could she ever come to the position that she was healed? Uh, there's only one explanation that I can get for an intelligent person today with cancer to go around with it and say, I'm healed. It must be some sort of a delusion that's brought about in a satanic manner, my friend. And I think we need to be very careful today about accepting anything in the way of miracles. May I put it like this? The Lord Jesus said before he came to this earth there would be a miracle worker that if it were possible to deceive the elect, he'd do it. He'd be that great of a miracle worker. Did you know that in the age in which we live, God has promised no miracle worker? God has said today, in this day in which we live, we walk by faith and not by sight. It's to accept and receive Christ as Savior and to walk by faith with Him. And the minute that you move into this other realm, you have departed from the walk of faith. And that is Satan's delusion in this hour to make somebody think that somebody is performing a miracle. 
And when you permit that sort of thing, I can't see that it's humility. Now, may I just make this as a statement of fact? Even Mr. Oral Roberts now has joined the Methodist Church. Well, he's made it. If you've been to Tulsa and seen what he has there, may I say I've been accused of getting rich by radio. When I get together what Oral Roberts has got together, then you can accuse me of it. But may I say to you, you can go look at my humble little bungalow up in Altadena. And by the way, it's paid for now, thank the Lord. I owned it with the finance company long enough. And after 20 years... It's mine now, but it's an humble little bungalow. And when I see a $5 million building in Tulsa, Oklahoma, made out of white marble, and I see a university that's being built there, may I say to you that I just happen to know that, that it's a tragic thing to think of the thousands and literally millions of people that give on the idea that somebody's performing a miracle and it's a miracle for that the Methodist Church got him, by the way. I'm willing to credit the Methodist Church with a miracle now they were able to get him. Now, let me move into another area. There are certain strange rites that are being performed today by certain groups. And some of them are calling it Satan worship. A minister of Satan performed a wedding in San Francisco with a nude back of him. That's become a well-known fact today and a picture that's been circulated, I suppose, everywhere. Why is it today, and I wish someone would investigate this, and I understand that there is a Christian psychologist, in fact, two, that are investigating the hippies from this viewpoint, by the way. Why is it that young people from good homes, and some of them from Christian homes and good Christian homes, where they have apparently everything in the way of comforts, and they'll go and live like dirty animals. And they are intelligent young people. I say to you that there's some Pied Piper that's leading young people astray today. And this sort of thing is satanic. Today, spiritism has intruded itself into the ecumenical movement. They have a committee of ministers to investigate it, not with the idea of condemning it, but with the idea of how can we learn how to do it. The liberal ministers have a committee on that today. It's not just a cult, therefore. It's like leaven that's permeating all the stratas of society and the church. Now, in conclusion, what can Christians do? I turn to one verse of Scripture, 1 John 4. Will you listen to John here as he speaks on this very subject? Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, why is it that even some of you people, I'm sure in a congregation this side, some of you will go and just the minute one of these comes along while you fall for it. Why don't you try the spirits and see whether they be of God or not? See whether God is in this thing or not. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You and I are living in a dirty, mean world today where Satan is abroad, if you please. And he can deceive us. I was very much interested in what Conan Doyle wrote. He says, High above all the greatest spirit of whom the spirits have cognizance, not God, since God is so infinite that he's not within their ken, but one who is nearer God and to that extent represents God. This is the Christ spirit. He came down to give the people the example and teaching of an ideal life. Then he returned to his own high station. This is the story of Christ as spirits have described it. Christ was a psychic. He chose the disciples for their psychic power. No doubt it was current belief at a time when many of the writers of the books of the Bible composed the treatises which you call inspired that Jesus was God. They were mistaken. Will you listen to what John says? Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. 
Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And you nail these down. And you will find that many of these today move actually themselves in the place. That they are the ones that have the power. They are the ones that are really doing it today. May I say to you, they rob him of his glory. They rob him of his position. And they move him out from the place that he should occupy. That is the Savior and the Lord of life. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. You try the spirit. Somebody say, how are you trying? Why don't you go to these folk and ask them specifically what they think of Jesus Christ and nail them down on it? Do you believe that he's God? Do you believe that he died for your sins personally. You'll get some very interesting answers, by the way, to that question, because when they're nailed down on that, they become very evasive, and they give you then what they call their viewpoint and what they think about it. And yet they'll say some very nice things about him. And you know you can kill him with faint dams, and you can also damn him with faint praise. And that is the position that many of them in. Now, may I mention some other things today that Christians can do in days like these. Every Christian lays himself open for the onslaught of Satan when he does three things. When he neglects the study of the Bible, when he neglects prayer, and when he indulges in sin. And when a Christian does these three things, you are wide open for the devil because Satan takes advantage of you at that time. Paul writing to the Corinthians, and they had gone into sin. He said, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. But today we are ignorant of his devices. And he takes advantage of us when we are not in the Word of God. And when we do neglect prayer, and when we drop into sin. And Paul warned us. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. We have a real enemy, and he takes advantage of us. He's not going to come to you with horns and cloven feet and a forked tail. He's not that kind of creature. He'll appear in the loveliest, the most religious manner that is imaginable, my beloved. And he deludes and leads astray thousands of people today. The devil goes about, Peter says, like a roaring lion seeking who may devour. He doesn't go around with that still, small voice. And isn't it interesting today, many of God's people love to hear the roar of the lion. They like it if it's big, sensational, healing, great things going on, my friend. Elijah had to learn it. A lot of Christians need to learn today, God only speaks in the still, small voice. That's where you're going to hear him, and that's when you're going to hear him today. And then we need to remember, he says to, James says two things. He's very practical. He says, submit yourself to God, and then resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I think today there are too many Christians that they poo-poo this, or they do nothing about it, and they go on in their own self-will, and then they find themselves taken in. What we need today more than anything else is to fall in love with the person of Christ. That's the thing we need today, is to stay close to him and love him. Oh, how we need to fall in love with the person of Christ. Now, tonight, I say this final word. If you are not a Christian, will you listen to me in closing this one verse? But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, 
who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If you are unsaved tonight, the devil wants to throw dust in your eyes. And he wants to shut you out from the one thing that can save you. If you had a prison that was walled in, impregnable wall, nobody could get under it, through it, or over it, and you had a guard to put it at just the one entrance, would you put him at that entrance or put him around at the back of the wall? You'd put him at the one entrance, the only place that you can get in and out. Isn't that right? Do you think the devil minds today if you join the church? He does not. Do you think the devil minds if you become religious? He does not mind that at all. There's only one door that he's guarding, and that's the door where the Lord Jesus said, I'm the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. The devil's watching that door, and he'll let you do anything in the world Except when you come to that door, he'll throw dust in your eyes. And he'll blind you that you need Christ as your Savior. That's the only place he needs to watch. He doesn't mind you being religious. You can be as pious as a monk. You can today be religious to your fingertips. And the devil will applaud you. But you better let Christ alone, because he can save you, and the devil does not like that.